cop watch actually was an idea that we had when we first moved into this house because we were concerned about our role in gentrifying the neighborhood as white people moving into a mostly black neighborhood that's gentrifying anyway. We were concerned that we might be hastening that process. We started hearing stories from people in our neighborhood about the routine amount of massive harassment that was going on by the cops and uh, the fear that people felt of the cops in our neighborhood. And we started asking around um, about who would be interested in helping out with Cop Watch and starting up a chapter and who would be interested in having it be there. And we got a uniformly positive response, a huge amount of positivity. So, um, so we thought that might be a good way to, to start fighting gentrification. At the time that we were starting to kind of kick around the idea of filming the cops, um, there was a lot of buzz and attention around the Red Dog unit. It's like a SWAT team slash vice squad thing. Um, they do a tremendous amount of drug raids. Uh, they're notorious for being like even unusually brutal for um, for cops. And uh, they uh, they had just been kind of caught out for doing this aggressive raid on a gay bar in town called the Atlanta Eagle. Um, and there was a big fuss about it, and lots of people from like the LGBTQ community were we're super pissed and we're starting to realize maybe the cops aren't on our side. Um, and we were talking with folks um, in, in that direction also of like, being upset about this is one thing, but figuring out ways to actually stop it, to combat these processes is something that we need to look at. What um, tools did you guys have to initially get started? It doesn't take that much tools to get started. Um, the main thing that we needed was advice from other people who'd done cop watch because we were justifiably uh, frightened of the backlash that we would see from cops. So what we did was call around um, to different chapters. A lot of folks on the West Coast were kind enough to meet with us over the phone and have conference calls and give us a bunch of advice. A friend of ours who had done cop watch in New York gave us a bunch of advice um, for how to get started. But as far as materials, Really, all you need is cameras and cell phones. When we see problems in society, um, it's not enough to ask somebody else to fix it for us. We need to look at ways to concretely solve those problems directly ourselves and to give other people who are facing those problems the tools that they need to solve those problems themselves rather than looking to politicians or companies or you know institutions in general to fix these things for us. Um, and Copwatch really does that in, in so many ways. Um, it's, uh, there's kind of this like political recognition of a problem, but then there's also a, an incredibly pragmatic way of confronting it. Go out there on the street, find the cops that are doing these things to people, and make it harder for them to do it. Um, and you can see that it works because you see the results when you're on the street. We've seen time and time again in cop watching and in protests, um, how one black protester will be pulled out of a crowd of white people and harassed or arrested. Uh, and I think that a lot of people of color that I've talked to have expressed um, concern that they'd be more likely to be targeted um, if they were to do cop watch, and I think that's a really valid concern. Um, but I hope that cop watch isn't something that is just limited to white people to be able to do because that would make it too narrow of a scope. Um, that, would, that would make it not that useful as a, as a tool for communities to protect themselves. Yeah. yeah, I think that it's not, like like the racial element is there, but really what it comes down to, I think, is that police uh, abuse and target the people that they feel they can get away with abusing and targeting. Um, and they often make the assumption like, oh, if you are Latino, then I can beat you up and you can't do anything about it. Um, and Part of the reason that they don't make that assumption about us is because we're young and we're white, but also because <clears throat> we demonstrate that we know what we're doing. Um, we give, a, you know, we have uniforms, we have organized teams, we know our shit, and we don't let them, you know, get us off track. Um, and, you, you know, we know legal experts, which lends us some confidence just internally that we know that if the cops try anything, 
we will be able to follow up on that. They won't be able to get away with it as easily as they would with someone else. In addition to hitting the streets, what other services have, has you guys provided as Cop Watch? We give trainings on what your rights are and we train other folks to um, do Cop Watch the way that we do it. Um, we have a cell phone so folks can call if they've been abused by the cops, if there's any way that um, we can help them or they'd like us to help them. Um, you know, we'll talk to you and try to do whatever we can. Um, we can file complaints with the police department or with independent review boards. We can get you in touch with people that we know. Um, you know, and we will. We'll put in effort to help you if you've been abused by the cops. No promises that we're going to be able to necessarily get justice, but we'll do our best. We're learning more about... Um the open records process and the abilities for civilians to get documents from the police department or the government in general, um, which is interesting because it's something that you don't have to be a legal expert to do, but um, you can learn pretty interesting things just by figuring out the specifics of how to use that process. That's something that I would recommend for other people who are dealing with police corruption to learn a little about because it can be a valuable tool. East Atlanta Cop Watch has had some success in affecting policy or changing policy within the Atlanta Police Department. I was wondering if one of you guys could go a little into that. Yeah, um, so fairly early on um, in our project, before we had really established the reputation of that we knew what we were doing and that we were not to be messed with, um, we were in a little Five Points neighborhood, which is kind of just up the street from here. Um, we see some cops, um, they're raiding, I guess it's like a head shop type place. Um, they pull a guy out in handcuffs and there's a bunch of cops, like plainclothes cops wearing these police vests. Um, and so I had a camera phone, um, and I just start filming the cops. They tell me I can't, I continue to film them, they come and like physically mess with my camera, and they proceed to like grab me physically and wrench it out of my hand and confiscate it. Um, and at that time, we didn't have a lot of the procedures that we have in place now, so we did not have another camera rolling at the time, uh, which we thought was bad news. I thought that maybe we had just kind of gotten owned by the cops. Um, but it turned out that later um, I acquired the phone number of the cop who had seized the, the phone from the evidence department, called him up and recorded a call of him essentially confessing to the fact that he seized my phone because I was recording them um, and that he would give it back to me, but only if I would assist him in deleting the footage off of the phone. It's not a mistake. I put it in on evidence on purpose, okay, because we asked you not to film and you kept on doing it. Here, here's what you can do. You, you have the right to film us. That's not a problem. The problem is you don't have the right to film the person under arrest. And the fact that he was also going to work with us puts us in a bind where that film cannot get out there. So to get your phone back, you're going to have to go down there with me, and we're going to, I'm going to have to delete it, any, any film or pictures you took, or it'll have to stay in there until we're done with this case because it's an open investigation. You okay. understand what I'm saying? Um, okay, yeah. It, it was my understanding that the, um, that the footage was deleted, though. Is, is that not the case? No, I can't delete it. It's password protected. You'll have to go in there and put your password in, and I'll get in there and delete it. So with that, we were able to go to a civil liberties lawyer um, who, surprisingly to me, was completely eager to take the case. We didn't really even ask him. We called him up to ask advice, and he was like, I will represent you. Let's do this. Um, filed a lawsuit. The uh, Atlanta Police Department was forced to settle... Um, by paying us $40,000 and amending their um, standard operating procedures, which is the police manual of rules that they must follow, um, to say um, officers are not to interfere with the public's right to record them. Um, and we actually have another friend who um, was, ar was arrested in a similar case for taking pictures of a man being beat up outside her house. And... Um, she followed a similar um, trajectory, and her case was settled after ours, and her settlement required the police to strengthen that, um, the, that rule. 
So now the rule is, not only are officers not to interfere with the public's right to record, but violation of this procedure is a code D, I think, which means dismissal violation, which means that the officer must be fired if they break this rule. I say someone's watching this and they're like, oh, you know, I've always, like, I see the need to get involved and, you know, really, uh, what you said speaks to me. Like, where, where should they spend the next couple hours? Like, what resources should they check out or read or watch? We're always happy to have people get in touch with us. We'll uh, come to your town and give trainings uh, on knowing your rights and on how we do Cop Watch and help you set up a Cop Watch chapter in your town. So definitely feel free to give us a call, 678-390-0393 or you can go to our webpage um, and contact us through that, um, copwatchoea.org.